Hello, everybody. Welcome into the Woody Hayes Athletic Center. I am Austin Ward. This is Tim May. This is Jeremy Birmingham. This is the Letterman Row practice report brought to you by Byers Auto as we get set for the Buckeyes and Michigan State on Saturday night in the Horseshoe. And Tim, they're wearing those fancy black jerseys. Aren't you excited to see those alternates? Don't you love them? You know, I got to admit, you know, I'm going to be straight up with folks. I'm not a fan of the alternate stuff. Uh, imagine you've been saving up your pennies. You're a little kid, you know, from like uh, Illyria. You've been saving your pennies for like years to finally get to watch the Buckeyes and the Horseshoe. And they come out in their black unis instead of their classic scarlet and gray you know, you know where I'm going with that. Uh, yeah, you didn't but go home and tell everyone you got to be there on one of the cool nights. Yeah, yeah, one of the cool nights. You know, but, but as, as I as I like to say, if you're gonna wear alternate unis, you better win. You know, that's the bottom an alternate line. Universe, 99 percent of the time, so I'm fine with alternates of all sorts. Yeah, don't they? Well, the thing that they say, Berm, and just to lead off the show, not even By talking way, about football. Wait, wait, let me interrupt. I understand why they're doing the alternate well, unis. Well, that's why I was gonna ask Berm right here, Tim. Like, it's a perfect segue. Aren't they supposed to help recruiting? Uh, don't they work? I don't know. Tell me about it. No. <laughs> let's, oh, okay. let's be clear. Do recruits care about uniforms? Do they care about the way they look? Of course they do. Everyone who's been an athlete knows that the better you look, the better you play, right? I mean, that's, you look good, you feel good, you play good, right? That's, that's an old adage, right? But it doesn't matter in the sense of, I'm going to go to this school because they wear these black uniforms once a year. That's stupid. Yeah, I mean, if Vanderbilt That's wears stupid. all black, right. I mean, Vanderbilt looks great in those all black. Yeah, no, exactly. They, they, they should don't. get every five star out they, there. They don't. Okay, on to football. That's the uniform talk. That's about all that I can stand. Tim doesn't want it. Well, this it gets, gets part and parcel to what we're going to see on Saturday night. Maybe. I don't know. Is, is Michigan State going to come out with some sort of highlighter color? I don't know. It's, Gosh, all my, you talk about alternate uniforms. Those are the worst that you can possibly have. I had to so, go to the optometrist after watching that game. No matter what Ohio State wears, they're going to look better than Michigan State. They're probably going to play much better, too. They are once again a double-digit favorite, Tim. Justin Fields is becoming a Heisman candidate. There's more talk about Chase Young. Uh, but I guess if there's one theme throughout this week that we've heard a lot, it's that Michigan State's run defense uh, could be the biggest test for J.K. Dobbins and Justin Fields and Master Teague and this offensive line. And, you know, uh, the stats look good, but for me, I just don't buy it. I can't get the memory of two years ago out of my brain where that was supposed to be one of the best run defenses in the country. And Ohio State ran for 300 plus on them and four touchdowns. So I don't see a problem, but what do you see? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this this Ohio State football team, as we're watching it today, is as, mo is as capable as any team in the country to do whatever it needs to do to move the football, throw to the edges, throw over the middle, throw swings, throw deep, beat zone coverage with just throwing over the top. What I'm getting to here is this is as capable a team there is to beat any kind of defense you want to throw at them mm -hmm. if you give them like a play to figure it out. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, you got to admit Ryan Day and Mike Yurcich and, and Kevin Wilson, I think they've been doing a great job of mixing things up from one from one possession to the next. Like I said, the Master Teague package, the fatigue package they put in the other day, a three straight plays, a swing pass, a run through a huge hole over left tackle, and then a run, what, two yards for a touchdown yeah. over the left side where he just plowed through there. That's what this team brings to bear. It has options no matter what you throw at it. Now, granted, you know, it depends on guys being healthy and guys paying attention and doing their job. This offensive line, we were just talking with Wyatt Davis earlier today, and uh, this offensive line is, clicking about as well as any offensive line in the country. Agreed, Bermanology? It's, they're playing pretty great. I mean, I think they're playing better than they did a year ago at this time. I, what we watched a year ago was a ton of RPO stuff for the Buckeyes early in the season, and there's not been a lot of that this year. They know what they're doing, and I think that makes a big difference. But to take this back to Michigan State, I mean, yeah, they, they defense looked good against Tulsa. Who cares? Um, they looked okay against Arizona State and lost to a true freshman quarterback, and then they gave up 31 points to a true freshman quarterback from Indiana last week and allowed 20 straight completions against them <laughs> by Michael Penix of Indiana. I so didn't mean to laugh that hard. Color me skeptical <laughs> that this defense is as good as we are led to believe it yeah. is. I know they have NFL talent on their roster on defense. Kenny Willickis two years ago, I'm sorry, last year, um, was as good a player as I saw against Ohio State. And, and he agreed abused Isaiah Prince last year in East Lansing. But I just don't buy it. And maybe I'm going to be proven wrong on Saturday night, but there's nothing about this Michigan State defense outside of Kenny Willickis, and I think Joe Bocci's an incredible middle linebacker, uh, but I don't know that a middle linebacker is going to beat this Ohio State offense. Yeah, and that's what I was getting to. Ohio State does not – does not it's not, the, it's not the good old days of a long time ago. They don't have to play in the box. 
they can play all over the place. Right. And uh, that's what beats a good defense is the ability to go to the edges, beat the edges, et cetera, and then work on the beating them in the box. And that, that's what I expect to see on Saturday night if they stick to what they've been doing. And good personnel helps too. And I think this, you look at Ohio State, they don't have Brandon Bowen on Saturday night in Nebraska, and they just roll in a guy, Josh Alby. He becomes the player of the game. He's filled down twice in the last six games for Ohio State now. One was the Rose Bowl. One was the Rose Bowl. left tackle. Left tackle. On the road at Nebraska, goes out in right tackle. And that was – it's hard for me. I said this the other day on your podcast, Tim, for me to sometimes look at offensive linemen live and come away impressed. I'm just not that great at the X and O's part in the trenches. But Josh Alby was just – burying people out there on Saturday night. Wyatt Davis is doing the same thing. Jonah Jackson is one of the nastiest guys in terms of mindset, I think, on the team. Josh Myers is coming along. And then, I, you know, last but not least, Theron Munford at left tackle, who is probably a guy who's going to leave school and be an NFL draft pick next spring. So the point is, this offensive line has come. There was a the offseason you spent being concerned about replacing four yeah. full-time starters. I think that's turned out okay. Yeah, the, the key thing to watch when you're watching an offensive line there's two key things. Are they driving guys back when they're running the ball? Even even on zone plays, I mean, they're getting guys and driving them. They're not just like getting in front of guys and you know trying to create. And they're getting to the second level. That's easy to watch from the stands or television. And then number two, when Justin Fields needs to throw the ball, has he got time to throw it? You know, there's been a couple of times where there've been some leaks. They're going to be yeah. teams are blitzing. They're doing delayed blitzes. They're doing the all kinds of things. Credit the majority of Justin Fields' yeah. sacks this year have been on Justin Fields. Yeah. yeah, he's had four or five seconds to stand back there and then just held on to. It too long. Yeah. Most situations, that quarterback's going to throw the ball away or run when you have that much time. And there have been at least once in every game where he has been standing back in the pocket, and you're wondering, what is he? Is he going to do something? <laughs> More power to him, though, looking for the big, big, yeah. the big play. It's, I mean, it's not, you a know. testament to what the it, line has done. I think it's also for Justin Fields just to. It's not looking necessarily for the big play, but he seems opposed in in every circumstance to making the killer play. So it, if if he holds. For one or beat one or two beats too long, and yeah. then tries to use his feet. I mean, he's looking to throw, but he doesn't want to throw an interception. Yeah, and when I say big play, I'm talking about waiting for a guy you know who's, who's been covered initially, but then to come open on like you know come across the middle things like, like that. Fairly, yeah. And sometimes you do get lost in that because you're feeling really good. Like Michael Penix Jr., what he completed, what did we say, ten straight or twenty, 20 straight, twenty straight passes against Michigan State the other night. I think that bodes well for Ohio State because I like Ohio State's receiving core much more than I like Indiana's. I like Ohio State's thrower. Now, we didn't get to see Michael Penix Jr. when Ohio State played at Indiana, but I like Ohio State's passer better than I like Michael Penix Jr. And then you add the specter of Justin Fields and his, and his feet, <laughs> and uh, J.K. Dobbins, Dobbins, the way he's running so hard, it's ridiculous right now, and also being patient. Uh, like I said, this offense is clicking. All right, this is the uh, Letterman Row practice report brought to you by Byers Auto. That's a quick rundown of what we've learned so far on offense this week, so defensively. Saturday night, Ohio State finally got Jonathan Cooper back from that high ankle sprain. Felt like he should have got an assist on one of Jeff Akuta's picks there, the way he got in Adrian Martinez's face and forced yeah. a throw high. Uh, Teron Vincent, we saw him, the defensive tackle, walking through the facility. Berm nudges me and says, hey, he doesn't have that sling on. I, I still don't know. This could be an injury that could keep him out for the rest of the year, but that's at least one positive development for a guy who really wants to play. Yeah, there's somebody said, hey, take that sling take off it before off you walk the through the media. But uh, well, he did have the practice jersey on and the yeah. sling off, yeah. so gotcha. it's a plus. Two things there, and then Tyreek Smith will continue to wait and monitor that ahead of the availability report on Friday, which we will cover as soon as that's out. But uh, having Tyreek Smith wasn't. It didn't look like he did practice, though, no, from so what I could see. It's uh, it's not looking as great for him. It looked encouraging initially. He was going through warm-ups two weeks ago yeah. before Miami of Ohio, and then that – uh, hasn't really happened since, so we'll we'll keep uh, digging on that and let you know what we hear. But get to the Jonathan, defense, man. Get Jonathan, to the defense. Okay, but Jonathan Cooper is back, <laughs> and that pass rush still is looking even. It's getting better every week, I think. And Chase Young is at another level. I don't. What can Michigan State with this offense hope to do against the way the Silver Bullets are rolling right now? Uh, that's going to be interesting because Michigan State's, you know, you were talking about my podcast, I had Jack Ebling on, he's been covering Michigan State and uh, uh, for a long time. But, you know, they've been robbing Peter to pay Paul on their offensive line. They've got a guy that's going to probably start at left tackle who was like left or right guard a couple weeks ago. And they're just like just shuffling the deck. And I just, you, you got to believe uh, both Jonathan Cooper and uh, Chase Young are champing at the bit to yeah. get into this one. And then, and then past that, uh, you know, this defense, guys, it, I think it's – Ohio State is a story, is a national story. But I think the biggest national story on this on this team is the way this defense, the transformation that we've seen from a team that 
uh, guys that were running at each other couldn't get out of each other's way <laughs> to now just triggering and just at, at times just dominating. I mean, I mean that was a good offense they played against the other night. Yep. It didn't look like it because Chase Young was tearing them up. B.B. Landers was tearing them up. Devon Hamilton, uh, Jay Sean Cornell, uh, right on down the line, pardon the pun. And then <laughs> and then at linebacker, you know, you're sitting there, and all of a sudden Nebraska gets something going. They go back to yesteryear and pull out the I formation, hand it to the fullback on some belly plays. They have a little success there. Then for whatever reason, they decided to then throw it, and uh, Jeffrey Okuda gets an interception laying on his back. As Berm said, they took one timeout. It was, it was an incredibly it was crazy. important timeout. I mean, I think – we talked about it after the game on Saturday, and you sort of scoffed at the idea initially, I think, that that timeout mattered, but it did matter, and it got Ohio State a chance to recoup and, um, you know, regroup, and then they recoup? Got, a, recoup? Got, an recoup? Regroup? got an interception oh. next play. I think the reality is Mike, Mark Antonio on Tuesday said that he doesn't view Chase Young in terms of being a human, which is pretty – on point, I yeah. think, for what he's done to defenses. Well, Scott Frost called him the beast. Uh, so. there, there's, a, there's a lot of respect right now for, for Chase Young and what the defense is doing. But yeah, there was going to be improvement on this defense from last year to this year. There's nine starters returning, right? I mean, they were going to be better. But I don't think anybody really knew if they could trust that it was going to be this much better. And it, it really all starts with the defensive line. It starts with Chase Young. It starts with... You know, guys like Chase Young Cornell who have been totally underrated for, for years. I mean, he's always played good football, but now he's in there a lot and making plays. And then you see the development so quickly. And this is where Ohio State has this tagline about developed here, right? If you watched the season opener and saw what Zach Harrison looked like on the field in that game yeah, compared to what he looked like on the field on Saturday night against Nebraska, in four weeks he has gone from being a freshman who had no idea what he was doing to looking like a player who was ranked in the top five as, as a top five prospect yeah. a year ago and is now turning into a, a troublemaker for a, offenses. And yeah. it's just playing early too. You see a, de a defense that is full of talent and nobody has done more to earn my respect as far as a coach than Al Washington. Yeah. Because what the linebackers have done and they're doing a great job rotating them in, they're switching out Baron Browning and Tough Borland for situational stuff. And I, I think that you've just seen leaps and bounds improvement in a group that had a lot of reason to doubt itself. And don't don't discount scheme, guys. I mean, you're sitting there watching on, on Saturday night. Next thing you know, here's Ohio State. Maybe they've done this. I didn't notice it earlier this year. Four, deep, four down linemen, four linebackers, including Justin Hilliard, mm -hmm. and three defensive backs. Yeah. And they just pretty much played, well, hey, that's a throw us. <laughs> exactly. Throw us your fastball. Let's see if we, you know what I mean? I mean, th that may have been the bullet. That may have been whatever. But there were four, you know, renowned linebackers on the field. It was lined up and as a 4-4. Justin Hillier, you know, he was in on that big hit that Pete Werner had on the on the, uh, on the the Wandale Robinson. He was in on that big hit from behind. But uh, I thought he played extremely well, flashed in some big plays. And that's what, uh, scheme-wise, I mean, what Greg Madison and Jeff Halfley especially have brought to this thing it's obvious. Yeah. All right, put a bow on this uh, pr preview here, practice report tonight for us, guys. Uh, you weren't there on Monday with us at Roosters when I gave my prediction. It was a large, large win for Ohio State for me. Uh, there's been – everybody always talks about this. This is the theme for the year. Is there going to be a letdown? Uh, Michigan State, uh, they've ruined two seasons in the last uh, six years for Ohio State. Is there any chance of that happening in your mind on Saturday night, either one of you guys? I don't believe so. I haven't really made up my mind on a score type situation, but I can see Ohio State getting back to the 40s again, and I don't see Michigan State getting to the 40s, or maybe even the 30s, or maybe even the 20s. <laughs> the 10, going. the 5. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> there was a team that scored 5. So, But uh, I just think this, this Ohio State team right now is playing extremely well on all three sides of the ball. I know that the past is not an indicator, an indicator or indicative of yeah. future events, right? But Michigan State hasn't scored a touchdown against Ohio State in the last two seasons. Uh, I expect that they might score one this week, but I don't think that from a, a fan perspective, I don't think that there's a, a lot to be scared about on the Michigan State offense. Daryl Stewart's a nice receiver. Brian Lewerke is leading the Big Ten in passing yards. But I, I think the Buckeyes are significantly better than Michigan State, and that's a 42-14 to 14 Buckeye win. All right, a couple big wins predicted here from these guys. You heard mine on Monday on Letterman Live. This has been the Letterman Row Practice Report. It's brought to you by Byers Auto. That is Tim May. You know him. Jeremy Birmingham. I'm just Austin Ward. We're going to see you right back here next week on Wednesday night for the Practice Report. It'll be a bye week, but we'll still talk about it, and we'll have coverage of Ohio State and Michigan State all week at LettermanRow.com. We will see you there.
Thanks for watching. Subscribe below to get the latest videos from Letterman Row. We've got Letterman Live, we've got the practice report, we got rapid reaction. Hey, and you know we got Buck IQ with Zach Bourne. For sure. We got recruiting breakdowns with Berm. We got whatever you need. Ohio State football and Ohio State Athletics, we've got you covered here at Letterman Row.